It's time to introduce the derivative of the trigonometric functions and they're part of a larger group of functions called transcendental functions. Now uh, uh, the common examples of transcendental functions are the trigonometry functions like sine and cosine, there's the inverse trig functions, uh, exponential functions like e to the x, logarithmic functions like natural log of x, uh, hyperbolic functions, I don't know if you know what those are yet, um, these are some examples of transcendental functions, and what they are, they're functions that cannot be written as a finite sum or difference of algebraic terms, as far as uh, um, including roots, things involving roots, like cube roots or, or square roots. Uh, so you can't write them as polynomials, you can't write them as, uh, uh, as uh, um, rational functions. You know, which is uh, polynomial divided by polynomials. You can't put, you know, can't represent them as just square roots and cube roots. So they're totally different. And the uh, ignore this for a minute. The, the the sine function, for example, the best we can do with it, the sine function. I can't remember if I mentioned this in a previous video. Maybe not. The sine function is um, x minus x cubed over three factorial plus x to the fifth or 5 factorial minus x to the 7th, or 7 factorial, on and on and on. Again, I can't remember if I mentioned this in a previous video, but uh, these are called factorials. 7 factorial, exclamation mark, means 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, 5,040. And anyway, it, it looks like an infinite polynomial, <laughs> infinite degree polynomial. Because it's not finite length, it doesn't qualify as a as a um, non-transcendental function. So, anyway, um, transcendental function. And by the way, this this formula for sine is very easy to get once you have had a little more calculus under your belt. Very easy to to understand and uh, and get. But that's usually reserved for a second semester calculus calculus too. Okay. Well, um, I a lot of textbooks lay out all the transcendental functions at once, and a lot of them only do the trigonometry functions and then save the others for a different chapter. I'm going to save the others for a different chapter because you know, you got enough on your plate right now really getting down those rules of derivatives. And um, so, but we're going to throw in, let's throw in the trigonometric functions uh, into the mix and that will give you more interesting problems to work with. All right, with all that preamble, uh, the linchpin to doing these is figuring out the derivative of the sine function. Once you got that derivative down, you can get the other trigonometric functions. And later you can also get the inverse trig functions. And, and I know, I've told you that derivative of sine is supposed to be cosine, right? So why don't we just say, oh, well, okay, I'll just use that. Well, because, you know, this is calculus, and some of you may be math majors, you need to see some proofs. And this one is a real classic, a real classic. All right, so uh, once again, we use the definition of derivative. The derivative of a sine x is limit as, of, as h goes to zero of sine of x plus h minus sine x over h. And uh, what, what do you do with that? You know, you can't, it, 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 <laughs> it has a removable discontinuity. Derivatives have, we calculate a derivative by the definition of derivative, and that limit, there's a removable discontinuity. However, it's not obvious where it is because this is not algebraic. So it turns out we have to use some geometry in this to work this out. And so it's, it's, to me it's a fascinating proof. It's a, it's a one-time shot. And um, what do you do with this? Well, first of all, we do have an identity that allows us to expand the sine of a sum of two angles. And incidentally, um, a very important point to make here x is, a, is in, in radians. It's in radians. So, um, now if you've totally forgot what radians are compared to degrees, then uh, it might be a good idea to watch my, I have a review video, a uh, trigonometry review for calculus, which I did a couple years ago. And it's gotten, uh, gotten a lot of uh, hits on YouTube. So. I'll, uh, I'll put that link uh, for this video in the comments section in case you want to review your trigonometry. It's about maybe an hour long video 
And uh, I've got some really nice comments about it, so apparently it must hit pretty well. But Radians, just a real, real fast review. High Radians is equal to 180 degrees. And so it's, uh, or two pi radians is 360 degrees, you know, complete circle, it's two pi radians. All right, uh, why is this so important? Well, because this formula is going to be a lot easier if we assume that the angles are in radians rather than degrees. If they're in degrees, we're going to get something pretty ugly. And so in calculus, something to get used to, all, you work all your trig problems in calculus in radians because all the uh, derivative and integral formulas involving trigonometry uh, are assumed to be in radians. And if you were to uh, work it in degrees, it's going to be way off. Or it's going to be very messy. Alright, so x is in radians. Now then, there's a, a nice, uh, as I said, there's a nice uh, identity that allows us to expand the, sub, the sine of the sum of two angles. And let's see how it goes. This is going to be the sine of x times the cosine of h um, plus the uh, cosine of x times the sine of h minus sine x all divided by h. Okay, so it's sine cosine plus cosine sine. It's, uh, you have to mix your angles up there. Uh, Alright, now, uh, what in the world do we do with this? Um, well, let me, I gotta, I gotta think a minute. Um, oh, let's see here. Yeah, I'm going to factor out the sine from these two functions. So I'm going to create two limits here. This is the limit as h goes to zero. And if I look at these, these two here, it's going to be sine of x. And I, and I, um, factor out the sine from these two terms. So that gives me cosine h minus 1. And this is divided by h. And then plus the uh, limit as h goes to 0 of cosine x sine h over h. All right. So. This term comes from the middle part, and this term comes from these two pieces when you factor out sine. And uh, another thing we can do is, when it comes to limits, just a reminder, the if my limit variable is h, then I can factor out anything that doesn't have h in it. So here I can factor out sine. I have sine x times the limit of cosine, oops, yeah, you know, cosine is pretty easy to spell. I just blow it. All right, we'll try that again. Limit of cosine h minus one over h. H goes to zero. Plus, and here I can factor out cosine x because there's no h in cosine x. Cosine x limit h goes to zero of sine h over h. All right, so I'll, I'll tell you that this is the big one. If we get this cracked, then everything else falls into place. It's wonderful. <laughs> so um, bear with me on that. Um, this is what I have to solve right there. So I'm going to do some erasing. I need to draw a diagram, and, um, and we'll go from there. So I kept our statement of the derivative. The derivative of sine is this mess here. And um, I, drew, I drew the picture. I drew a wonderful picture here. It took me a minute to, to figure out the diagram again. I haven't done this for, oh, I don't know, a year. And, um, but um, I need this triangle. And I also need h to be in radians. The angle has to be in radians. And so the, um, that's important. Now then, you might uh, recall from, uh, well, first of all, this triangle, this small one has a hypotenuse of 1. And when I swing it down here as part of a circle, that makes the base of the larger triangle one also. Now the arc length, um, arc length in trigonometry we might call it S. S for some reason means arc length, arc length, I'm not sure why, is radius times angle. S equals R theta. You might remember that from taking trigonometry. 
And, uh, but it's um, in here, my radius is 1, and my angle is h. So this arc length is simply h, like that. And as far as the rest of this goes, I have um, from the small triangle, the sine of h is opposite over hypotenuse, so sine of h is sine h divided by 1. And for the large triangle, the tangent of h is opposite over adjacent, so tangent h is tangent h divided by 1. Very nice. So, what we have here, the, um, the sine of h is less than h, which is less than tangent h. Is that obvious? I think it's pretty obvious that this arc length is longer than sine h. Uh, based on how I drew it, is it obvious that this arc length here is less than tangent? Hmm. I don't know if that's so obvious. Uh, it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. Uh, you know, as soon as I'm done with the video, I'll probably think of, uh, later today I'll think of why that's true. And, um, but it, it is. It is tangent. This side is longer than that, that curved arc length side. All right, um, so be that as it may, I think the easiest way to do this is to take this inequality and divide by um, the sine function, sine h. And I'm going to take the limit as h goes to zero of this inequality, <laughs> okay? Now, um, yeah, why? Well, see, I want to trap this limit between two limits I can calculate. So I'm using the squeeze theorem, the sandwich theorem of limits. Wonderful application of the sandwich theorem of limits, which we talked about oh, some videos back. The, um, now, I do have the reciprocal of it in here, but I thought it would be easier to look at it this way. So as long as I divide by a positive number, then my inequality signs do not change. Actually, it wouldn't matter anyway, but, uh, but you know, in the first quadrant, the sign is going to be positive anyway. And um, so I wanted to trap this, and the fact that I have the reciprocal of this, it, it won't matter. It won't matter. So um, this ends up becoming the limit as h goes to zero of, that's one, less than h over sine h, less than, uh, what's tangent divided by sine? <laughs> okay, it's 1 over cosine, isn't it? 1 over cosine of h. So why is that true? Tangent h divided by sine h. Well, tangent is sine divided by cosine, and then I have 1 over sine so when you simplify tangent divided by sine, you get 1 over cosine, 1 over cosine h. All right, now then, um, we're about done. Because as h goes to 0, the cosine of h goes to the cosine of 0. And then what's the cosine of 0? <laughs> it's 1. So this, term, this, this is converging to to 1, so as a limit, we have this limit is trapped between 1 and 1. It gets squeezed together between 1 and 1. Guess what? The limit is 1. So that tells us that this limit um, has to go to 1. It's between 1 and 1 as they get closer and closer. So. Since that's 1, its reciprocal is also 1. So the limit of sine h or h is, is 1. Look at that. Oh, isn't that fantastic? Okay. So um, that means I have a cosine of x here. What about the rest of this mess? Well, um, this limit we have to deal with. So I'm going to erase the top part of the board and work with that. Actually, this one's pretty easy to work out. So. Give me a minute, I'll erase the board. So the remaining issue is what happens here, this part? What's the limit as h goes to 0, cosine h minus 1 over h? 
Well, this is still 0 over 0 because cosine of 0 is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0 divided by 0. So, um, I have to do something. But there's a, it's a really nice trick on this one. If I multiply top and bottom by cosine h plus 1 over cosine h plus 1, then we get the limit as h goes to 0. When you multiply this, you're going to get cosine squared h minus cosine plus cosine. When you foil it out, the cosines cancel. And I have minus 1 over h cosine h plus 1. There we go. And, um, ah, well, it looks like it just got worse, didn't it? Well, not really, because we have a nice identity. Remember that the cosine squared x plus sine squared x uh, means that cosine squared x, if I subtract 1 and then subtract this, cosine squared minus 1 is equal to negative sine squared. So I can rewrite this as limit h goes to 0 of negative sine squared, except my, my variables, h not x, over h cosine h plus 1. Alright, now what? <laughs> okay, well, uh, if I split this up, we, we can finish the, this part of the proof. And here's how you split it up. This, um, I, I wonder who came up with this the first time. And, and, Probably took an afternoon of, of dabbling around to figure out the, all the, the tricks on this. Uh, of course, they had great minds working this calculus in the late 1600s. Probably, uh, may, maybe Newton and Leibniz both figured out the, the derivatives of the sine function pretty fast. But, um, but they would have had to think of tricks like this. All right, so I can break this up into uh, sine h over h times minus sine h over cosine h plus 1. All right, so some theorem way back said that if both these limits exist, then this limit exists. So I can, I can split this up into a product of two limits if, if both those limits individually exist. All right, well, we know what this one is. We, we just figured it out. This limit goes to 1. And over here, as h goes to 0, this goes to 0, or negative 0, doesn't matter what you call it. It goes to 0 on top, and cosine of 0 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2. So I have 1 times 0 over 2. That would be 0, wouldn't it? That's 0. So this, um, this part of the problem, this limit, goes to 0 which means the sine times that limit is going to disappear. And the only thing left standing is cosine times 1. So the derivative of a sine is, at long last, cosine of x. So that's why it works. Isn't that wonderful? Um, I like that. So I'm going to um, uh, create a separate video and, and next work out the derivatives of you know, another probably two or three trig functions. And then we'll, we'll have the trig functions down.